No, there are two prophets that would prophesy and preach in the last days. Who are these two prophets? There is a message by these prophets and their messages would preach in the last days. Who are these prophets? Number one, the prophet Daniel. Jesus said that the prophet Daniel would preach in the last days. Matthew 24, verse 15 says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso read it, let him understand. So Jesus said that the prophet Daniel, he would speak in the last days. And those who hear his message and read his message, let him understand understand. So we must be hearing and reading the prophet Daniel. Well, how can we be sure? Let's go to Daniel chapter 12 now. Daniel chapter 12, and we're going to see that in the last days, in the time of the end, that Daniel would be a book that was sealed, but it would also now be revealed. The seals would be let loose, and people would now understand the prophet Daniel, the prophecies of Daniel. Daniel chapter 12, the Bible says in verse 4, Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, the Bible says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. So Daniel would come in the time of the end. His book, his prophecy, in the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. So many, as, as they study Daniel, as they read Daniel, knowledge is going to increase, and they're going to run to and fro, spreading the message of Daniel. The Bible says in verse number 9, and he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end, the last days, the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. So here we're seeing that Daniel is going to stand up in the last days, the time of the end. And in the last days, Daniel's prophecy would be revealed. Daniel's prophecy would be understood. And the Bible says, many shall be purified and made white. So it shows that as we read the book of Daniel, there must be an experience that we can have of being purified and made white. So the, the book of Daniel would have an effect upon our characters. But not just Daniel, there's two prophets, amen? Two prophets that Jesus said would preach in the last days. So one is the prophet Daniel. So what is the other prophet? The other prophet is the prophet John. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 1 to 3, 1, 2, and 3, actually 1 verse 3, the Bible says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, who? John. Amen. We said in Amos chapter 3, verse 7, Surely the Lord God will do nothing but reveal his secret to his servants. Who's the servants? The prophets. So his servant John or the prophet John. So God has given this revelation of Jesus Christ to the prophet John. It goes on to say in verse 3, Blessed is he that readeth. They that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. So in the last days, we should be hearing from the prophet Daniel, his prophecy, and the prophecy of Revelation from the prophet who? The prophet John. So in these last days, in our churches and in our world, we should be hearing two prophets preaching in the last days. Who are these prophets? The prophet Daniel and the prophet John. The Daniel and Revelation go together. And this is what ministers should be preaching in the last days that Jesus said they would preach. Gospel workers, page 148, it says this. Ministers should present the sure word of prophecy as the foundation of the faith of seven-day Adventists. It says the prophecies of Daniel and the revelation should be carefully studied in connection with the with 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 these words behold the lamb of god which taketh away the sin of the world gospel workers 148 so ministers should be preaching as the foundation of the faith for seventh day adventist christians we need to be studying what daniel and revelation with behold the lamb of god which taketh away the sin of the world now we know we need another witness amen at the sound of two witnesses the thing shall be established so testimonies to the ministers page 114 it says this when the books of daniel the prophet daniel and revelation through the prophet john it says are better understood believers will have an entirely different religious experience they will experience being a friend of god they will experience christ coming into the heart they will experience the salvation of their souls it says they will be given a, such a glimpses of the open gates of heaven and that the heart and mind will be impressed 
with the character that all must develop in order to realize the blessedness that is to be the reward of the pure in heart. So as we study Daniel and as we study the book of Revelation, there is a promise that we can have a change of character. Amen. A change of heart. We can become pure in heart. So we need to study the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. So in this message, we're going to deal largely with the book of Daniel. And then our next message, we're going to deal largely with the book of Revelation. So let's look at Revela on Daniel chapter 2. Since we're in the book of Daniel, let's go to Daniel chapter 2. And let's look briefly at the prophecy of Daniel. We should be hearing the prophecy of Daniel. Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 9. Understanding the investigative judgment. Understanding the 2300 day prophecy. Understanding what Jesus is doing in the most holy place of the sanctuary. Understanding the time of trouble. We should be learning these things in our churches, in our homes, and in our world. The books of Daniel and Revelation must be prophesied. Even, even Revelation, the mark of the beast, the seven last plagues. Can we understand these things? We should be hearing these messages in our churches, in our homes, and in our world. So Daniel chapter 2, we know the story very well. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And Nebuchadnezzar's dream, as he dreamt this dream, he woke up and he could not remember his dream. And he called the uh, soothsayers. He called the astrologers. He called the wise men. He called all these people to tell him the dream in the interpretation, and none of these men could do it. As a matter of fact, they, Nebuchadnezzar was so angry, he said, if I cannot find someone to tell me the dream, I'm going to kill everyone. And so he was troubled and he wanted to know the dream and the interpretation. But I want us to understand is that Nebuchadnezzar's dream was not for his day. It was for our days. It was for the last days. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 2 and verse number 27, it says this. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, secret, the secret which the king had demanded, cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king? But there is a God in heaven that revealed secrets unto the servants, the prophets, the prophet Daniel, and make it known unto the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days or the last days. In, the, in thy dream and in thy visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy, my, thy mind upon thy bed, and what should come to pass hereafter? What should come to pass? That's, that's prophecy. That's in the future. And that he might reveal it, he reveal its secrets and make it known unto thee what shall come to pass. So God does not do anything, but he reveals his secrets to his servants who? The, not the wise men, not the soothsayers, not the astrologers. God is not using palm readers. God is not using psychic lines and psychic readers. Amen. God is using the prophets. God is using his word to understand prophecy. So we don't have to go to those people. Amen. Palm readers and soothsayers. So Daniel understood that God is going to reveal secrets because he reveals secrets to the servants of prophets. Deuteronomy 29. Verse 29 says the secret things belong to who? Not to the soothsayers. Not to the astrologers, the uh, secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of his law. That's Deuteronomy 29, 29. So God is revealing these secrets to us. So Daniel stood before the king, and the Lord gave Daniel the dream and the interpretation. Daniel was a man of prayer. He was a man that trusted in God. He was a man that was not... Uh, mixing with the world and their standards. He was mixing with God and his word. As a result, he was the only man that could understand prophecy. And what we need in these last days are men, men of God, men of standard who will not mix with the world and compromise, but men who will pray and men that will read their Bibles and understand what their position is as men. Notice the quotation here. Education, page 57. It says, the greatest want of the world is the want of men. Men who will not be bought or sold. Men who in their inmost souls are true and honest. Men who do not fear to call sin by its right name. Men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole. Men who will stand for the right, though the heavens fall. So Daniel was a man of God, a man of prayer, a man of truth that was not afraid to call sin by its right name, that was not afraid to stand up despite the apostasy around him. And this is what God is looking for. He needs men. What the world wants today is the want of men. Remember that quotation. What the world wants is men. Because we're going to come and find out what the world needs. What the world wants and what the world needs must be blended together. And what the world wants is the want of 
of men. So Daniel begins explaining to Nebuchadnezzar this statue, this image that was set up, that was in his dream. It was a head of gold. It was chest and arms of silver. It was belly and thighs of brass. It was legs of iron. It was feet part of iron and part of clay. Let's read it. Daniel chapter 2, the Bible says in verse, Daniel chapter 2 and verse number, let's look at this. In Daniel chapter 2, the Bible says in verse 31, Thou king sawest. And behold, a great image, this great image whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was, was, was terrible. The image's head was of fine gold, the breast and his arms of silver, his belly and thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. And thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. And he was, and then, then was the iron. And the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold, it says, broken in pieces together and become as the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away and there was found no place for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So this is Nebuchadnezzar's dream. It was in his time that comes all the way until the last days, all the way until a stone comes out and smokes the image made of gold, the head of gold, smokes the image made of silver, chestnuts of silver, smokes the image made of belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, feet part of iron, and part of clay. Now, what is this head of gold? The Bible says in verse number 37, Thou, O king, art of king of kings, for the Lord God of heaven had given thee a kingdom and power and great glory. The Bible says that God gave Nebuchadnezzar, this king, the king of Babylon, power and great glory. The Bible goes on to say in verse 38, and where the sword of the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field, the fowls of the heaven, hath given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. So the head of gold represents Babylon. Babylon ruled the world, the whole world. Wherever the sons of men would dwell, where they lived, that's where they ruled. Wherever someone was walking on the ground, that's where they ruled. Wherever birds fly, that's where they ruled. Wherever beasts of the field were trod, that's where they ruled. They ruled the whole world, the Bible says. And Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, was the head of gold. The head of gold. If you read Isaiah chapter 14, the Bible says that Babylon was the golden city in the Lord's hand, the cup in the Lord's hand. So Babylon is the city of gold, the head of gold. They ruled from 605 BC to 538 BC. But the Bible says that another kingdom would rule above this head of gold. Notice what the Bible says in verse number 39. Verse number 39, it says, and after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. So in history, God shows us prophecy that Babylon will rule the world from 605 BC to 538 BC. This is true in history. And it's true in these last days. Another kingdom ruled after Babylon, and this kingdom is the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. We find this in Daniel chapter 5. Let's go there. Daniel chapter 5. And you can find this in encyclopedias. You can find this in looking in different history subjects, but we're seeing it in the Word of God that God prophesied that these things would take place. So the Medes and the Persians would rule after Babylon. They had a party. And we know what happened at the party. The judgment of God fell upon that party because they started to praise the gods of gold and silver. And notice what the Bible says in Daniel chapter 5 and verse 30 and verse 31. It says, in that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans are the Babylonians. The king of the Chaldeans was slain. And Darius, the Median, the Medes, the Median took the kingdom, took the kingdom of Babylon, took their power. And being about three score and two years old. So he was taking this kingdom, the Bible says, at 62 years old. And not just the Medes, because he was a Median king, but the Bible says it was the Medes and the, the Persians. And verse 28. Verse 28 of Daniel chapter 5 says, Perez, the kingdom, the kingdom of Babylon, the kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. So the Medes and the Persians would rule after Babylon. And the Bible says, according to history as well, that the Medes and the Persians, they ruled from 538 BC to 331. So here we're seeing the Medes and Persians would rule after Babylon. But God says there's going to be another kingdom. There are four kingdoms that rule the world. Babylon, Medo-Persia, there's, there's another one. What's this other kingdom? Let's go in our Bible now to Daniel chapter, Daniel chapter 2. And the Bible says in verse 39, Daniel 2, verse 39, the Bible says, And after thee, that's after Babylon, 605 to 538, it says, After thee shall arise another kingdom. We saw that that was what? Medo-Persia, 538 to 331. 
inferior to thee, that shall arise inferior to thee, and another third kingdom, the Bible says, of brass. So who is this third kingdom? So we saw number one was Babylon. We saw number two was Medo-Persia. Who is this third kingdom? Let's go in our, in our Bible now to the book of Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, there's a point I want to make here, that even though in Daniel 2, it talks about these metals, and Daniel chapter 7, it talks about beast, amen? And a beast and these metals are the same thing, it just represents a kingdom, just like how they will have, for, for sports, they will have a mascot, they will have a beast that represents the, the nation or, or the team, there is a beast which represents a nation or a kingdom. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 7, and the Bible says in verse Let's look at verse 23. The Bible says in Daniel 7, verse 23, Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom. So a beast represents a what? A kingdom in Bible prophecy. Now let's look at what beast was reigning third after Babylon, after Medo-Persia. In Daniel 7, we see that there are three specific beasts. In Daniel 7, we see that there's three. There is the lion. There is the bear, there is the leopard, and then there's a beast that can't be described. Just like how there's four metals in Daniel 2, the gold, the silver, the brass, the iron. There are four beasts in Daniel chapter 7. So these are similar. They are the same, the same kingdoms, the same nations. Now, if the gold represents Babylon, the lion has to be Babylon. And we'll study this another time. If the bear is the second one, it has to represent what? Be the Persia. Make sense? And so the third one has to be the brass. What is the third kingdom? Let's go to Daniel chapter 8 now. Daniel chapter 8. We understand this beast and this third kingdom when we look at Daniel chapter 8. So Daniel chapter 8, the Bible says in verse number 20. Are we there? Daniel chapter 8, verse 20, the Bible says, the, the ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of the Media and Persia. That's the second kingdom, the ram. The beast represents Medo Persia. Now, the third kingdom now, notice the Bible says in verse 21, the rough goat is the king of Grecia. It says, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. So the kingdom that arose after Medo Persia was the kingdom of Grecia or Greece. Make sense? So the third kingdom, the kingdom of brass, the kingdom of brass, billion thighs of brass, represents Greece. And Greece ruled the world from one. Well, I'm sorry, 331 BC to 168. So here we're seeing the tread of events taking place in Daniel, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and we have one more kingdom as the head of gold. He dreamed of this, this vision, head of gold. He dreamed of the chest and arms of silver. He dreamed of the belly and thighs of brass. He dreamed of the legs of iron. What is this legs of iron? What is this kingdom of iron? Let's go in our Bible now to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2, these legs of iron, we're going in the Bible now, Daniel chapter 2, and notice verse number 39, it says, After Babylon, after thee shall arise another kingdom, and fear to thee, which was the Medes and the Persians, and another third kingdom of brass, which is Grecia, and the Bible says, which shall rule over all the earth, these were world-ruling powers. Now verse 40 says, and the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron. For as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdued all things. So let's stop there. So the fourth kingdom would rule with iron. And this kingdom would rule the world with iron. Who's this iron kingdom, this fourth kingdom? We know that when Jesus came, he came in the time of Rome. Remember when Herod wanted to kill all the babies when Christ was born? Herod was a part of Rome. And so Rome has to be the fourth kingdom. Notice what this says here, because all the world would be affected. They rule over all the world. And in Luke chapter 2, verse 1, the Bible says, And it shall come to pass in those days, that, that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. So this kingdom that ruled the whole world, all the world should be taxed. Caesar Augustus, that comes from Rome, amen? And so we're seeing that in Daniel chapter 2, verse 40, the kingdom that would rule the world in, in the time of Rome, this legs of iron, was Rome. And it was pagan Rome. They brought in paganism into the church. They brought in statues and all these things. They tried to change God's law, God's Sabbath law, and started to baptize paganism into the church. They started bowing down to idols into the church. And this is what has been going on in paganism, papal Rome, pagan Rome. Are you with me? And so the legs represent pagan Rome, 168 to 476 AD. Now, let's keep studying. The Bible says that Daniel, as he saw this vision, God gave him the interpretation. Nebuchadnezzar dreamed that the feet was part iron 
and part clay. Now we need to understand this. This is very important. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 2, and notice what the Bible says in verse Daniel chapter 2, the Bible says in verse 33, it says, His legs of iron and his feet part iron and part clay. So he saw legs of iron and clay. We already said that the iron represents Rome, and the feet was part iron and part clay. Now, iron and clay, which one is stronger, the iron or the clay? The iron is stronger, even if the clay hardens. The iron is stronger than the clay. So it shows that there are two nations, two powers, two kingdoms that would join together in the feet, iron and clay. And clay is the weaker vessel, right? Clay is the one that's weaker. And so the weaker vessel would join with a stronger vessel and they would join together until they, they try to, to, to get stronger. But the Bible says in Daniel chapter 2, verse 41 to 43, whereas, whereas thou sawest the feet, the toes, part of the potter's clay, and part of iron. The kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it the strength of iron. And for as much as thou sawest, the iron is mixed with what? Miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken, partly weak. It says, and whereas thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, that they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with miry clay. Now there is a dual application here. Back in the day, uh, Napoleon, all these, all these men, as they were ruling in their kingdom, they tried to mingle with the seeds of men to make their kingdom stronger. But the Bible says it would be divided. But in the last days, there's a present truth application about the iron and the clay. The clay is the weaker vessel. The iron is a stronger vessel, and the iron and clay represent church and state. The iron and clay represent, again, church and state. There's going to be a mingling of church and state. Notice this quotation now. Manuscript release, page 63, 1899. It says, the mingling of churchcraft with statecraft is represented by the iron and clay. The union is weakening all the power of the churches. It says, this investing the church with the power of the state will bring evil results. Men have almost passed the point of God's forbearance. They have invested their strength in politics and have united with the papacy, the Catholic Church. But the time will come when God will punish those who have made void his law and their evil work will recoil upon themselves. So she says, church and state represents the iron and the clay and the weaker vessel, which is the clay, will run to Rome, run to the papacy, run to the church to get stronger. Because as America gets weaker through the shootings that are taking place in schools, as America gets weaker by the tsunamis taking place, by the earthquakes taking place, by the hurricanes taking place, by the murders taking place, America doesn't know what to do. So America will seek, the people will seek to join with Rome, to become stronger, to become stronger, and they will unite. And the Bible says when this takes place, it will result in evil. When this takes place, we're going to see that God's forbearance is almost done. We're going to see probation is soon to close and that Christ is coming soon. So this mingling of church and state is America mingling with the Catholic Church, the papacy. And we're going to see that very, very soon. As a matter of fact, when you, America unites with the Catholic Church, they're going to unite under principles that will break God's law. Let's look at the quotation one more time. It says that it, it, this will result in evil, and then it goes on to say, and they will make void God's law. So my question is, when America joins with the papacy, the Catholic Church, to result in evil, they're going to make void God's law. My question is, what law are they going to break? The Ten Commandments, Amen. And what specific law in the Ten Commandments are they going to join under? Let's go in our Bible now to 2 Peter. 2 Peter, the Bible says, chapter 2. 2 Peter, chapter 2. Aren't you happy that we don't have to guess at this? Amen? That the God reveals these things before they come to pass. 2 Peter, chapter 2. Notice they're going to join and they're going to break and turn against the holy commandment. That's what the Bible says. The holy commandment. We're going to 2 Peter, chapter 2. And the Bible says in verse 21, it says this, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21, For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness. And by the way, righteousness, the Bible says in Psalms 119 verse 172, All thy commandments are righteousness. So this group is going to 
turn away from the commandments of God, from righteousness. It says, for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it. They known the law of God, the righteousness of Christ. It says, after they have known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Notice it said holy commandment, a specific commandment. It didn't say holy commandments because we know the commandments are holy, right? You can read this in Romans chapter 7. It says, we know that the commandments are holy and just and good. So there's a specific holy commandment they're going to turn from. Amen? What is the holy commandment they're going to turn from in these last days? Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, the Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It is the only holy commandment that Christ mentions in the Bible as holy in Exodus chapter 20. And so we're going to see they're going to turn from the seventh day Sabbath and they're going to follow another day. They turn from the holy commandment, the Bible says in verse 22, but it has happened unto them. According to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again and the soul to to the soul, the soul that was washed in her wallowing where? In the mire. Notice that Daniel said that the iron is going to be mixed with what kind of clay? The miry clay. In Jeremiah chapter 18, the Bible says that Israel is like potter's clay. The potter is God and Israel is potter's clay. But here we're seeing a joining of the iron, Rome, mixed with the miry clay. The mire represents sin. The mire represents sin. In Psalms 40, verse 1, 2, and 3, David is calling out to God. He's saying, the Lord heard my prayer. He, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he heard my prayer. I inclined my voice unto him, and he delivered me out of the miry clay. He took my feet out of the miry clay and set my feet upon the rock. Now, here's more evidence that the miry clay rep represents sin. Because in Matthew chapter 7, the Bible says that those who hear God's word and do it are those who place their feet, they build their house upon the rock. Amen. To hear God's word and do it. So to not hear God's word, to not do it, you're not on the rock. You are in the, the miry clay. Make sense? And so here we're seeing that the miry clay represents those who turn from God, from God's holy commandment, and they will join with Rome. So in the last days, God is showing us there's going to be a union of church and state, the Catholic church will unite with the state to try to make the state stronger. But the Bible says they're going to turn from God in the last days. There's going to be a national Sunday law that will lead people to reject God, to reject his truth. And in the last days, there's going to be a national apostasy. And God is trying to get us ready for his kingdom. God says his kingdom is not of this world. Amen. And if his kingdom was of this world, we'd fight. But our kingdom is in heaven. God's kingdom is in heaven. Daniel 2 and verse 44, the Bible says, And in the days of these kings, Shall the God of heaven, in the days of these kings, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome, the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom that shall not be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand how long? Forever. So God is going to have a kingdom that will stand, not fall. It will stand forever. So as Babylon fell, Medo, Persia fell, Greece fell, Rome fell fell, and is falling, papal Rome, oh, by the way, so the pagan Rome is the legs of iron, papal Rome, the legs of iron, the feet of iron and clay, amen, we're living in the time of papal Rome, the Bible says these things will fall, but God will have a kingdom that shall not fall, it will stand forever, so God has, has a kingdom in heaven that will not fall, amen, it's going to stand forever, the Bible says in Revelation 11, and verse 15, the seven angels sounded, and there was great voices in heaven saying, the kingdom the kingdoms of this world are become as the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So God's kingdom will last forever and ever. It will not fall. It will stand. Matthew 6, verse 10, Jesus said, we need to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. As we see these setting up of these false kingdoms that are trying to stand, that they're going to fall, Christ says we need to prepare for the kingdom of heaven. And the kingdom of heaven is connected to the judgment and the second coming of Jesus Christ. So as we see these things happening, we should be prepared to stand in the judgment and prepared to stand for the second coming of Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, it says, I charge thee therefore by God and the Lord Jesus Christ, whom shall judge, whom he shall judge, the quick, that's those who are alive, and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. So the kingdom of God is closely connected to his coming and to his judgment. And Jesus, when he came on earth in the time of Rome, he was preaching Daniel chapter 2. 
He was preaching the prophecies of Daniel. He was uttering the words of prophecy. Notice Daniel chapter, I'm sorry, Matthew 4, verse 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Jesus himself was preaching prophecy, the gospel of the kingdom. And brothers and sisters, we need to hear pastors, elders, leaders preach the gospel of the kingdom, which is Daniel 2. Amen. We need to be hearing Daniel chapter 2. And it is the preaching of Daniel chapter 2 that prepares the world for the end of time and the second coming of Jesus. Matthew 24, verse 14 says, and this gospel of the kingdom, we saw this in Daniel 2, shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So the preaching of Daniel 2 prepares us for the coming of Jesus and the end of time, the close of ovation, the mark of the beast, the time of trouble, you name it. It prepares us for the end of time. Now, if God has a kingdom in heaven, does he have a kingdom on earth? Does he have a church on earth? The Bible says that it will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So if there's a kingdom in heaven, he must have a kingdom on earth. And the Bible says the gates of hell will not prevail against this kingdom or against this church. So if God has a kingdom in heaven that will not fall, it will stand. He must have a church on earth that will not fall, it will stand. And even though the church may appear to fall, God holds his supreme regard on his church. And we're told that his church will not fall. Matthew 16, verse 18 says, I say unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I build my church. By the way, this rock is Jesus, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Not the Pope, not a father, not a bishop, not a man. This rock is Jesus. And the Bible says the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. God's church will not fall. God's church will stand. Maranatha, page 204, it says the church may appear as it is about to fall. But it does not fall. It remains while the sinners and Zion will be shifted out, shaken out. The chaff separated from the precious wheat. This is a terrible ordeal. But nonetheless, it must take place. None but those who have been overcoming by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony who will be found with the loyal and true with, without spot or stain of sin with, without guile in their mouths. The remnant that purify their souls by obeying the truth, gather strength from the trying process and exhibiting the beauty of holiness amid the surrounding apostasy. So we're told that there's going to be apostasy in the church. We're told we won't be hearing this message in the church. We're told we're going to see all kinds of things in the church. But that doesn't mean the church is going to fall. God's people, God's true people will be made manifest during the time of this event. Notice what this says here. Testimonies to the church, ministers, and gospel workers, page 46. There are two opposing influences continually exerted on the members, not of the world, but the members in the church. One influence is working for the purification of the church. Daniel chapter 12, verse 10, many shall be purified and mean white. There are some people studying the prophecies and experience this purification. But there's another class the other for the corrupting of the people of God. So there are two people in the church as Jacob and Esau were in the same house. Jacob and Esau had claimed that the same father. Jacob had a character for God. Esau had another character. So it is in these last days. There are two characters in the church. We must remember that we are church militant and not church triumphant yet. Evangelism, page 707. The work is soon to close. The members of the church militant who have proved faithful will become church triumphant. So now is the time where we are facing war, spiritual war. In our own life, the flesh is warring against the spirit. The spirit is warring against the flesh. We see this in um, Romans 7. This is church militant. We're warring against ourselves. We are our greatest enemies, and we must overcome by the word of God, by the spirit of God, and God will help us to become from church militant to church triumphant. Closing. So God has a church, a kingdom in heaven, so he has a church on earth that will not fall, it will stand. Second Samuel chapter 7, verse 16 says, And thine house, that's the church, thine house, and thy kingdom, that's in heaven, shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established for." Ever. So God has a, a house, a church that will stand in a kingdom in heaven that will stand. Luke chapter 1, 32 to verse 33, it says, And he shall be great, and he shall be called the son of, right, of the highest, and the Lord God shall give him the throne of his father David, the throne. It says he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. That's the church, the house of Jacob, and his kingdom there shall be no end. So the house 
will stand and the kingdom will stand. It will be forever. It will stand and not fall as Babylon fell, Medo-Persia fell, Greece fell, Rome fell. God's kingdom and God's church will not fall. It will stand. But we must make sure we are connected. We are connected to the kingdom of God. We are connected to Jesus Christ. Luke chapter uh, 17, verse 21 says, Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. Behold, the kingdom of God is in you. God's kingdom begins within us. You know, if we live a certain place, then we must have evidence that we live there. Either you receive mail, you must receive evidence that you live there. If you have a car, there must be evidence, car insurance or whatever you have to prove that this is yours. So we must have evidence by the Spirit of God dwelling in us, by the fruit of the Spirit, that we are not citizens of this world, but citizens of the world to come. Now, here's the evidence. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Watch these six points now. The mystery of godliness. Number one, God was manifest in the flesh. Number two, God was justified in the spirit. Number three, he was seen of angels. Number four, he was preached unto the Gentiles. Number five, he believed on and he was believed on in the world. And number six, he was received up into glory. So this is the mystery of godliness. When Jesus came into the world, he was God manifest in the flesh, justified by the spirit, seen of angels, Preach unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. I believe there's six points here because the seventh point is we're going to be resting with Christ for all eternity when we experience these six points. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, working upon our character. But on the seventh day we rest and we will be resting with Jesus. But we must experience these six points. And the, the, the point of this is that the world can now see whose we are that we belong to God, that we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Ephesians 6 verse 19 says, And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. We must make known the mystery of the gospel. Ephesians 3 verse 9 says, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. So the world must see that we are in fellowship with Jesus. And what is this mystery? Let's go in our Bible now. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. What is this mystery? The mystery of the kingdom, the mystery of the gospel. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, it says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory. And we know that glory is character, amen? The riches of the glory of the ministry, the mi mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So the mystery is Christ in us, the hope of glory, as we're surrendering to Christ, as we're yielding to Christ. Christ wants to be in us, in our hearts, and in our lives, the hope of glory. So while there's one class that is refusing this mystery, another class is receiving the Spirit of God, growing spiritually, surrendering their hearts to Christ, agonizing over their spiritual condition and receiving the glory of God. Ministry of Healing, page 143 and 144, we're getting ready to close. It says this, and notice these words are for today. We are living in the midst of an epidemic, Christ, a, a epidemic of crime at which thoughtful, God-fearing men everywhere stand aghast. The corruption that prevails is beyond the power of human pen to describe. Every day brings fresh revelations of political strife bribery and fraud every day brings its heart sickening record of violence and lawlessness of indifference to human suffering of brutal friendless destruction of human life every day testifies of the increase of insanity murder suicide all the sh shootings taking place today especially in schools who can doubt that satanic agencies are at work among men with increasing activity to distract and corrupt the mind, and defile the, 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 the file, and destroy the body. And while the world is filled with these evils, the gospel is too often presented in a so different manner as to make but little impression upon the consequences of, the, the, I'm sorry, the consciences and the lives of men. Everywhere there are hearts crying out for something they have not. They long for a power that will give them the mastery or victory over sin, a power that will deliver them from the bondage of evil, a power that will give them health and life and peace. And many who were once knew the power of God's word have, have dwelt where there is no recognition of God and they long for the divine presence. Remember I said there's, there's a want for the world, the want of men? And here's the need now. It says the world needs what it needed 1900 years ago, a revelation of Christ 
A great work of reform is demanded, and it's only through the grace of Christ that the work of restoration, physical, mental, and spiritual, can be accomplished. So we saw what the world wants is the want of men, men who will not be bought or sold, men who will call sin by its right name, men who will spend much time in prayer and the study of God's word and live it in their lives. And there's a need of the revelation of Jesus Christ. So we need men and women who are filled with the revelation of Christ's character. And as they are filled with the revelation of Christ's character, God is going to use them to finish the work. God wants to finish the work. Amen. And we're told here in Revelation 10 verse 7, but in the days of the, sh in, in the, days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. And he had declared to his servants, the prophets. So God wants to finish this mystery. God wants to finish Christ in us. The hope of glory. Every day we must make a choice. Will I serve Christ or will I serve myself? Will I surrender to Christ or will I surrender to myself? Do I want the things of God or the things of this earth? Do I want to listen to worldly music or Christian music? Do I want to dress in a way that pleases God or a way that pleases myself? Do I want to eat which feeds my appetite or do I want to eat what God wants me to eat? Genesis 129. We got to ask ourselves the question, who we will serve? The, songs, the, the, the writer says, choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We must choose who we're going to serve in these last days, in this great controversy. Christ in us, the hope of glory. That is the mystery. Now, how can we receive this glory? Let's go in our Bible. Last scripture. Second Corinthians, I'm sorry, Second Chronicles. Second Corinthians, rather. Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians chapter 3. Second Corinthians chapter 3. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much. For the power of the Holy Spirit, we ask that you will even now give us an understanding of how we can practically receive this glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So 2 Corinthians chapter 3, the Bible says in verse number 18, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18, the Bible says, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So the Bible says, by beholding the glory, by beholding the character of Jesus, by spending time with him moment by moment, having morning devotion, prayer, and meditating on the life of Christ, by beholding we become changed into the same image from glory to glory, glory to glory, character to character. We're beholding Christ, we become changed. See, the problem is not with God. God wants to finish the work. The problem is with us. We stop beholding Christ. As soon as Sabbath is over, we want to behold what we want to behold. As soon as the Bible study is over, we want to behold what we want to behold. As soon as prayer meetings are over, we want to behold what we want to behold. But we must behold Jesus, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. We're told, study Daniel, study Revelation with the connection. Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. We must behold Jesus. And as the chosen of Israel were bit by the serpent, and all of us have been bit by Satan, bit by the serpent, and we're dying spiritually, the only way to live is not through works, not through trying to do what's right, not, not through that, my friends. It's by looking and living. Moses let up the serpent on the wilderness. He says, if, if the Son of Man will be lifted up, if all who see Jesus and look and live, they would be healed. They'd be restored. And if we look to Jesus today, look and live, we can, by beholding, by beholding, by beholding, receive life. Look and live. We can behold him and then live a spiritual life. Behold him and then we have a prayer life. Behold him and now we're studying the scriptures. Behold him until we become changed. By beholding, we become changed. Today, I submit to us to behold Jesus. Amen? To behold him. Behold him in Gethsemane. Behold him upon the cross and behold him as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The Bible says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And the Bible says, behold, I come quickly. We must behold Jesus until he comes again. Amen. And we must not stop beholding him until he comes in. It says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in the King of glory. I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. We must behold Jesus. And as we hear his voice, if any man hear my voice, we might have to fast and pray to hear his voice. We might have to spend time with Jesus and hear his voice. Clear the diet, clear the mind, clear the distractions, and make sure that you hear his voice today so as the Son of God speaks to you, he can come in and will sup with you and you with him. The world is distracting us from hearing the voice of Jesus, but Jesus is speaking loudly through the two prophets, through Daniel 
and through John, the book of Revelation. And as we study God's word prayerfully, fasting and praying, God will speak to us and he promises that he will come in. Amen? He will come in. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer.